Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm really looking forward to my next special panel discussion with uh, Stephanie von Jan, Sven Schneiders, Ben Kaufmann, and for the first time also Keep It Simple Bitcoin, or also called Kai, on my show, uh, Limitless Rabbit uh, Hole Bitcoin Talk. So, you know, after all this suppression of information, of cover up, of uh, manipulation, First, they don't react, you know, the government, especially China, you know, after silencing the journalists, the doctors, or even maybe murdering them, I, who knows, you know, um, then getting, you know, all these people getting sick, lit, it's at least, uh, but, you know, it's not, it's, you know, we, we uh, they already knew about it in, I don't know, January or November, or whatever, January, February, they could have reacted like long time ago. So now they're going to the other extreme uh, um, uh you know, direction. So this means uh, everywhere, right? So we, it's a global pandemic. So what do governments do? You know, they curtail civil liberties. You know, they tell you stay at home. You're going to be fined. And, you know, it's getting surveilled and controlled and all these laws and draconian measures. So, you know, we got to take this seriously, of course. If it's contagious, contagious. If infectious, infectious. But, you know, we got to ask ourselves, are we asking the right questions? Do we have reliable, trustworthy sources? You know, objective, you know, not biased or WHO World Health Organization is independent on uh, corporate money or pharmaceuticals. It's a fact, right? And um, uh, distortion and, and dilution of information or uh, suppression of information. And on the other on the other hand, you know, what what kind of economical monetary implication does it for the economy for individuals? Have people losing their jobs now in millions right now in the United States everywhere. And business is breaking down. Uh, you know, um, are are these people being taken care of? Not doesn't seem to be. So yeah, but corporations are being bailed out. Boeing is being bailed out, even though you know there are of course uh, have always been uh, contractors, subcontractors, or whatever military industrial complex, but they are untouchable. But you know, as long as they can over leverage themselves by buy back shares of their own stock, so you know they can pay themselves at uh, at the end of their career huge bony and um, and and you know jack up the, the stock prices so this is legitimate right so yeah we're gonna ask ourselves you know a fundamental question um, does the state the government the central banks you know have a legitimacy question at all uh, there's many questions I want to discuss who knows you know where which which rabbit holes we're gonna get into but we really need to under, we need you know beginning as a you know childlike curious uh, child we got to ask ourselves the real questions um, you know do the states, do the nation states, the government, central banks, and every other centralized institution and entity have a legitimate right to exist? Uh, or are they criminal? Well, they are. They are criminal, but they have criminal immunity. They're politically untouchable, legally unaccountable, and, and criminally immune. So, yeah, are we those frogs in the water now finally as a mass, you know, humanities of civilization waking up to the fact that the, the, the water is about to boil? Or are we still so much in, I don't know, in, in, in a fainted condition that, you know, most people just don't get it. And that's why it's so hard, people, I think, for people to grasp, to understand, to comprehend the fundamental essence of monetary properties, the real potential power of Bitcoin. What does it mean for individual, for the society, for the civilization, as the totality, for the prosperity of, of each and every one of us. But, you know, this is the way it goes. So without further ado, this is my panel discussion. And please... I would really love to uh, have you uh, retweet, share it, give me a positive review on any podcast platform. If you're, if you're a Bitcoin sponsor, please get in touch with me. My email address is hello at the totalconnector.com so I can deliver more and better, highest quality content, video and or podcast. And yeah, we're here for the monetary, social, scientific, technological, spiritual evolution at the end of the day, right? This is what we're here for. This is why I'm here to educate. We're here to educate with all the Bitcoin friends, Bitcoin realists, Bitcoin maximalists, whatever you want to call it. But there's a reason, there's a logic, there's a there's a fundamental, you know, uh, essence behind it. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for your support. And this, without further ado, this is my panel discussion with uh, Stephanie von Jan, Smash Leaders, Ben Kaufman, and uh, Keep It Simple Bitcoin. All right, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. Uh, guys, thank you so much for coming, for taking your time. Uh, could each one of you introduce yourself, uh, Stephanie, Sven, Kai, or Keep It Simple Bitcoin, and Ben Kaufman? Yeah, so... 
Oh, I start off with <laughs> Stephanie. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Stephanie. I um, have a background in um, computer science and business and economics. And um, this kind of laid the foundation so I could like dive deep into like blockchain and Bitcoin technology. First, I went to more into blockchain and then uh, more into Bitcoin. And then I came to Austrian economics and I really went down the rabbit hole and realized the importance of um, a free market of money and of Bitcoin being one of the being actually like the, the best, in my opinion, for most use cases. And um, now I'm giving also lectures on economics and um, trying to to convey um, what is how economics are like really working and trying to debunk the Keynesian economic theories. Thank you. Thanks for coming, uh, Sven. Could you continue? Yeah, I'm Sven, and I I most people might know me from Twitter and from my essays I write on Bitcoin and all the other topics. I do have some background in computer science and programming, but I mostly come from the, I have a lot of interest and I come from physics and economics as well, obviously mostly Austrian economics. And I went on the Bitcoin rabbit hole in like 2017, 18 and got into some crypto blockchain stuff, but now I'm, now I'm fine. Now I'm only into Bitcoin <laughs> and realize that's, that's not most, most other things are not great. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Mostly just reading and writing essays. Beautiful. Thanks. Ben or Kai. <clears throat> uh, yeah, sure. So my name is Ben. Um, I'm a software developer. Um, mostly doing like uh, open source development uh, also uh, reading a lot especially economics uh, Austrian economics um, and sometimes like also write essays and stuff um, yeah but mostly coding Fascinating. okay hi guys um, yeah so I make tutorial videos um, just a serial entrepreneur, um, you know, found Bitcoin and it uh, made me do stuff I never thought I'd want to do. And um, I just, I think it's the most important thing, the most valuable thing I can spend my time on, um, aside from, you know, my my primary business and all that stuff, because I have to, but everything that I do in Bitcoin is because I want to, because I love it. So um, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I've been actually following your YouTube channel. It's pretty awesome. The tutorial or technical tutorials, which are, uh, let's say, partial, so pretty, you know, uh, suitable for real noobs, you know. So um, thanks so much for coming, guys. Uh, really my pleasure. I even, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't even know how to start up the conversation because there's so much topics I want to talk to you about. But uh, just for the sake of it, um, let me just put it into simple terms. Um, when it comes to this whole pandemic situation, the coronavirus, whatever it's called, SARS-CoV-2 or whatever, um, what are the questions we should be asking or we should have been asking? N you know, let's not make any p assumptions or predictions or all this, and let's not even go into the rabbit hole of this whole thing, but what do you think are the questions we should have asked or, or you know, or the mainstream media or, you know, journalists or you know, the community in total, like what questions have we missed? What are the questions we didn't ask and we should have asked? So what I saw, um, we could have asked how can each, each person improve their health so they have a better immune system. And this topic didn't came up at all. And this is what I'm like really missing. So yeah, but there are actually more things that I missed, but maybe the others also want to contribute something. Yeah. I. I would say that most people who think now that we need or needed more stronger government measures, let's say, are really missing the point that all those experts or all those committees really did an incredibly poor job at handling everything. Basically, if you did the exact opposite of what the World Health Organization told you to do, that would probably be the best thing you could have done. And that's really, 
I get where people are coming from and I'm I'm not totally opposed to that but you need to remind yourself how awful governments have been in this situation how bad the World Health Organization has really handled this they're still trying to spread the message of not wearing masks which is insane and there's still so much misinformation coming from these credible sources it's really it's really dangerous to to try to make an argument for we need more centralized authorities we need more um more of those top down measures when we see that those we we already have are not even working at all so i think we need more to go we need to go more into this localism decentralized kind of uh, thing where as stephanie pointed out individuals take more responsibility for whatever they're doing and maybe some government action is done at a really local level where things can be decided way better and this is probably my my biggest problem right now with the whole movement mm -hmm. yeah. and you want to comment or okay um not much to add i guess um i think like maybe for me what's most disturbing is that people uh, basically call to, to call to shut down the economy like i think what me, what most people miss is that the economy is not uh, it's not like a video game you can pause it's it's how we get how we get stuff produced and in these situations we don't want to shut down production we want to to modify it uh, we don't want to shut down production of everything we just want to shift resources from cinemas and stuff to more medicine, to more food, uh, to more masks. Um, so I think like most people just miss that we don't want to, to shut down, we want to respond to, to the virus. And the question should be, how is it, uh, how is it is, uh, best to respond? And not just to, you know, just wait until a thing magically becomes fine. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, literally the u.s economy has been pre the pause button has been pressed i mean it's it's amazing to see um what uh what's happening here i think the biggest thing here is <clears throat> and it applies to everything really is perception right because when i was watching these videos out of china in january and seeing how bad it was it's like what okay what's going on here and where are my blind spots because you may have an opinion, but if someone you know contracts whatever this is or whatever strain or whatever and gets ill, your perception automatically changes. Right. And that's something that you cannot um, translate to someone else because you post on Twitter, oh, my, you know, my friend got so ill, but then it's like, okay, you know, how many degrees of separation before people don't take that seriously? So everything is colored by your perception and your personal experience and how you deal with things really comes down to that because if i know someone affected well then i'm going to perceive this and take this a lot more serious than if i'm just seeing people in china in you know hospital floors filled with body bags it's like oh well maybe that won't come here or, oh you know so it's 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 such a it's such a subjective thing even though this is an objective event in the world still so much subjectivity in that yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I also think that's a problem with all these measures that we need to act before it seems necessary to act. So if the thing still is only in China, we could just, let's say, restrict air travel and we would be fine without shutting down much of the economy or without doing well, anything. How, how uh, could we be fine? Because you'd have to shut down air travel, entire the entire planet, because you can't isolate one place right it's like trump well, announced can, oh it's not early if you, you can if you well start if you early, if you yeah. isolate everyone there so anyone who's there is just stuck yes absolutely but, yeah and but like, people who, yeah. people who get out just go in like really restricted areas go in quarantine uh, quarantine and just get checked for like two weeks that would be a way better measure than what we have right now but the problem is you need to do it before it seems necessary before people have uh friends dying let's say next to them i absolutely agree with you point, but can i can, way too late let me give you an example that a great example of exactly what you're saying and how difficult that is 
I live in Florida <clears throat> and in New York, in America, is like the epicenter for this, you know, uh, epicenter, quote unquote. It's apparently worse than um, China, more and more infections in China, the, the official numbers, right? So people in New York are, are leaving New York and have left New York to come to Florida. And the, the state government here is saying, okay, if you do that, you have to quarantine. But there's no mandate. Nobody is forcing these people to quarantine. So more than likely, they're not going to quarantine and they're going to go out. And if, again, I always am saying if, because I don't know what's really true and what's not here, but if this disease is as spreadable as the mainstream is saying, those people are doing a tremendous disservice because they're spreading this thing far and wide because they're not being mindful because they don't, their perception of this is such that um, they don't agree with that, right? So short of draconian measures, which I do not condone, how do you stop something like this from spreading? It's such a, it's, it's such a tricky thing. Yeah. Is that is the prime example? I'm sorry. Is the prime example? Uh, this is also, you know, just reports I can rely on or we have probably all of most of us read is about like, uh, you know, countries like Singapore, because they already had the experience with SARS and they know exactly they, they were already like super uh, like uh, prepared for this. I mean, with all the materials, the masks, the medical uh, resources, the the like, you know, uh, put this whole contagious disease like under control. Uh, and and I think they were like the first one who 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 went into action and, and did really super preventive measures. Uh, this is what should have been done. But after all this, I mean, however I want to describe this, I think the the cover up is worse than I could describe it by the, whatever uh, Chinese government, CCP, whatever it's called. Uh, and, you know, the silencing of, of not only journalists, but doctors, uh, medical. I mean, it's, it's so it's so grotesque. I can't even imagine now whether that was on purpose because they're, you know, just uh, uh, they have their own agenda. It doesn't matter. It's just assumptions at the end of the day. But this is in the, this is the mess we're in right now. Yeah. What I'm missing in this whole debate is that it's extremely emotional and it's not uh, fact-based and evidence-based and I read a really interesting article, article by Aaron Jin. Um, it was taken down on Medium but you can still find it at archive.is and you can also find it at Zero Hedge and you know it's just a data analysis and this is I think one approach on how to do this but here I would also like to point out that we are relying on data that we get some from some some central authority and this is kind of an oracle problem because we have to trust the data but nevertheless this is one approach so we always have to you know be critical and we should ask like different experts and you see that there are so many different opinions out there so yeah it's uh, we should really like take into consideration different opinions the data and then make informed decisions and weigh pros and cons and also take into account the uncertainty and I don't see this yeah, I don't know who it was. Was it Safid Anamuz, the author of Bitcoin Standard, who started, you know, be, making himself very vocal about his opinion, and then and then Nassim Taleb even blocked him. So it's really weird because Nassim Taleb wrote the foreword into his book. So it's really getting really hilarious. So anyway, so uh, Safid Anamuz retweeted something like, uh, and that's a fact. Uh, the guy, the expert, a so-called expert, who is by the way funded and was funded uh, like 13 years ago in the SARS. App, uh, epidemia whatever it's called um, um, he used a code right like a like a modeling code which is not open source but closed source and the the whole data the whole uh, you know model is so old and so uh, um, you know not usable that uh, they used it again for the uh, for the corona pandemic which which again you know uh, delivered uh, totally false results and now it's all coming to the surface not with you know now aside the fact that the who is so uh, biased and so uh, financially interdependent from pharmaceuticals and other corporations but that's a story for itself it, it just becomes really uh, hilarious this whole story anyway yeah i would i would say that most of these most of these studies and most of these articles, it's really difficult to, as Stephanie has already said, to figure out what is really going on because you have to rely on some data. You cannot go 
there by yourself and check everything it's obviously impossible so i don't i don't really care as much about if these experts are right or wrong or if if i can convince them let's say even even if this thing is way less if even if it's not that bad and people are going to say look you all you all told us it's going to be really bad and now it isn't and why do we shut down the whole economy i don't care if these experts get convinced or i don't care if they if they let's say change their models but they are in the business of eroding civil liberties let's say and that that's what i care about if yeah. they they just had an opinion and just were let's say normal experts if for some topic i don't care but i just care because people or government leaders rely on them to to make policy decisions yeah and that's where it gets really dangerous because as some people have voiced their opinion on twitter right now it's difficult to get these liberties back if they have been taken away once and th this is a uh, a cost which is not factored in now it's it's been starting people are starting to factor in the economic cost the long-term economic cost and that's not some some abstract number people think of economic growth as some abstract thing but there's real jobs real right. income real food which is not produced and people for this this has been uh people have been factoring in this more and more but they have not been factoring in the lost liberty let's say which is difficult to factor in and everyone values their liberty at a different rate or different uh, price let's say but this is this needs to be taken into account and you cannot give all the all your freedom away just to just to have like maybe some some life saves let's say that they're, they're going to be this liberty you're going to give away will cost lives in the long run which is something most people don't understand it's a hidden long cost so it's really difficult to to think about it but you need to it's it's impossible to make informed decisions without it yeah that's a fundamental point i want to talk to you. thank you for bringing all these points are very well summarized uh um it's um i mean just in the united states alone uh how many unemployment um uh, applications i think or how many people have to become unemployed i think 3.2 3.3 million people and that's just in this phase and the projections are that if if it continues and you know and uh, the economy breaks down and they want to you know uh, whatever uh, central bank or or fiscal stimulus they want to pump into we're talking about trillions or <laughs> trillions into, i don't know when we're going to start talking about quadrillions but uh, let's let's start about okay let's break this down uh, you start off okay with the civil liberties and freedom do you want to talk about this first maybe i mean these are like the fundamental topic i want to talk to you about because it comes this whole pandemic or whatever it's come so conveniently into this system that uh, now they can you know take this as an excuse without even using you know police force coercion aggression military or whatever or calling out emergency as you might have heard the atlantic council even wrote in the report or maybe the nato should call out you know uh, a military i don't know a martial law or something i mean it's it's insane so what are we facing here when it comes to the curtailment encroachment on on, on civil liberties any of you i mean i can all right I, I would say that um this this these liberties let's say that we have or people in america for uh, for example have them even even more uh, have been they're costly in the sense that you know on a historic scale they were costly to attain and we should we should not give them away lightly let's say i would i would, would have been fine with as i've said travel the air travel from china all been blocked that's that's also a civil liberty thing but it's in my opinion would have been worth it way back in january let's say but now if we if we think about how this uh, pandemic is spreading and if the only measures we can take are complete lockdowns of our economy and complete lockdowns of people and there are some videos of police them um, drones catching people walking outside and people in the comments are actually shouting that they should be fined money or they should be whatever put in jail for just walking in some park and that's insane and people don't realize how bad it can get if this um if this real these 
su su just surveillance state uh, surveillance state thing gets gets out of hand and i i would argue it it is getting out of hand and people are trying to um surveil anonymous location data which is obviously uh not possible there is no anonymous location data if 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 they track where you work and where you live it's not really anonymous so the these all these these measures to keep people safe are really dangerous in the long run and it's obviously convenient if if for the government that they're just saying yes but we need to keep you safe guys it's all for your safety but i i would be more skeptical uh, of that claim than most people and this is all happening worldwide we have a reduction of private uh, of privacy and liberties worldwide this hasn't happened before oh yeah oh by the way bill gates just came out right i mean you might have heard <laughs> this is it goes so hilarious now he's, he wants to, what is it like? Uh, um, Put a chip in every person. Or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Really? I will not get the chip. I will not live in a pod. I will Definitely. not be fat and I will not get the chip. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I was talking to, I was talking to someone uh, about the chip actually. And, you know, attitudes are <clears throat> so telling because I said, I, you know, I would never get the chip and I, we can go down some rabbit holes, maybe better not to, but I would, I just would say no. But then the response is, well, what if they make it illegal? What if they make, you can't travel? What if this, what if that? And so people convince themselves that, well, I don't have any power here. So I just have to get the chip. I just have to do this. So it's like, what are you willing to stand for? You know, like what, what's the value of your liberty? What is the value of your liberty? If you're not willing to stand for it and i think that's what it comes down to like liberty is not something given to you and also maybe something that can't be taken like if you hold that just like you know self-respect or just like self-love or that you know all of these things like you it needs to start with you so if you stand for your liberty well it's much harder for an external actor, the state, whatever, whatever victimizer, whatever finger you want to point at to take from you. And the more people that do that, well, the more powerful, you know, the less powerful the state becomes. That's the ideal. But, you know, it starts with every individual. And how do you how do you foster that? I mean, that's that's like the challenge, because the majority of people all over the world really just want to be safe, taken care of, like, let's not let's not you know step outside of the box let's not um veer from societal norms and that that's the biggest uh, that's the biggest hurdle i think the first hurdle and, and you know that's not by accident that's part of that's that's how we're conditioned that's how the quote-unquote sheep you know and i'm not using that in a derogatory to our mm -hmm. term it's it you know it's been planned it's it's a very i mean you study it and you can see how planned and how um well, um, you know, every, every different part of this, this, the wheel, this system has been implemented to create an outcome where individuals do not stand up for anything because they're constantly in a, in a state of fear. Um, like, you know, it really, what are you willing to die for? If you're not willing to die for anything, mm -hmm. then all your power is just, is just it's it's in the hands of you know this the whoever else is going to victimize you uh and you know yeah it's it's such a it's such a big conversation but it really comes down to you have to be willing to give up what you value the most and what do most people value the most it's their life right because everyone is you know people are scared of death or scared mm -hmm. of the unknown scared of so if 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 you can't stand against that, like that, you know, foundational fear of, oh, death, right? I guess that's the most powerful one, really. People don't want to die. They're scared. Okay, so use that against them. Well, if you don't do this, you'll die. This virus is such a great example of that because it's like the most fundamental, visceral button in people. It's like, oh, I don't want to get sick. I don't want to die. I don't want my life to get ruined. So, you know, 
Patriot Act all over again in the States, obviously. I guess all over the world, we're seeing that stuff, but all over the world, like China, it's already terrible as far as civil liberties go. I mean, it's insane. Those people are, uh, anyway, I'm rambling, but yeah. Yeah, and wasn't it Denmark? Is it, I mean, is it law? Is it really, or was it just- Denmark, a, yes, they forced but, it. They, for, they enforced it, I think just a they, legislative proposal or something. Is, is, that, is that enacted into law? Like, like people have I, to, I don't to know. do mandatory vaccinations, all that shit? I mean, I read it was yeah, forced. Hopefully it's not true. Yeah, it's fucked. It's I mean, fucked. People, people don't even ask themselves, like, what is this vaccination? What is inside this vaccination? Are there particles in it, like nanoparticles? I mean, is there, I mean, is there, there, I mean, just look at all these children that have been vaccinated because it's, you know, I always say, you know, like when we, I mean, in my age, you know, I used to, we used to be, you know, get vaccinated, but there was a system behind it. You know, you, you got those vaccinations like in, in, in longer intervals, first of all, and they were totally comp different composition. And nowadays why they put, you know, mercury or whatever. I, I know I'm digressing again, but do people question anything like where does this virus come from how you know just asking you know i'm not you know taking making any prediction not any assumptions not any way conspiracy theories but are there any people where are those investigative journalists you know are they asking the right questions um that this this is my really ultimate question uh, are we asking the right questions yeah exactly i mean when did government ever hurt anyone right huh what ben when did government ever hurt anyone? I mean, we trust your government, man. <laughs> when did the government ever ever hurt anyone? Like so, I really trust. Let's verify. <laughs> <laughs> everyone so really has to challenge everything, like all their belief systems. And we know um, that the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, I I have the I have it here. It calls themselves the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States provides the nation with a safe, flexible, and stable monetary and financial system. We know that this is not true. And so many central authorities claim something about themselves and we have to challenge whether this is true. So challenge not only the financial system, but challenge all the other systems as well and start digging deeper. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. And as I've said, the the World Health Organization has been extremely awful at what's actually their job, which is preventing or, or let's say taking measures against something like this. And right now people really need to look studies up and look, look articles up, um, which are like about wearing masks. Um, that's my, that's my really important point. And I wanted people to, to really look that up because the, the WHO, World Health Organization is still saying that they don't work, but in fact they do work and even homemade masks and anything is better than no mask. And if we want to get into a state where our economy isn't fully shut down and people can go to work again, they have to commute in, in let's say trains and that it's going to be closed spaces, a lot of people and if we don't, if we want to let's say, keep this under control, people need to know that they have to wear masks. And all of these things come back to questioning authorities, questioning their reasoning. I have no problem with, with listening to any authority if it's just, if it's, if it's the, the, the points are, let's say, well argued. But if they just say that it doesn't work for no reason at all, it's really people shouldn't listen and should really make the make up their own mind. Yeah, Kai, uh, keep, uh, keep it simple. Bitcoin, just uh, send us a, a link. <laughs> this is interesting. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to mention, uh, ask if anyone had um, seen or read this. This was, uh, you know, what seems like eternity ago. Um, it was very interesting. I read it right around the time it was released and to yeah, I mean, it's not it's it's not surprising for something like that to be to be real, but um, the the level of uh, just um, conspiracy, you know, conspiracy and in, in people, you know, people getting together in order to do something. I mean, the fact that if this is true and there was a, an, a small amount of people that could lose a lot of money because of this this bond, 
this bet that there wouldn't be a pandemic. Um, and that's why the WHO took so long to declare it because they should have declared it a lot sooner. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, fascinating article. I'm going to re uh, uh, put those in the show notes. Um, so let's transition. There's this uh, also interesting article on Zero Hedge. Uh, uh, what's it called? Helicopter money. This is the true geopolitical game changer. So let's go into the legal, uh, into its economical implications. You know, the statements just recently also um, given by <laughs> by the what do you call the the director what do you call it of the chairman of the minneapolis federal reserve uh, like we got infinite amounts of tr of cash i was almost going to say trash <laughs> um wh what do you what do you make out of this statement i mean now now they're coming out like into your face now they're saying like you know this is this is this is how you deal with it and uh, um what do you think is uh, going to be the, the pro progression uh, phases Ah, yeah. So I would like to um, add something to that. So first of all, um, new money in the fiat system is not only created by central banks, but by other commercial banks as well. So we have incredible money that is printed right now. So we have to keep this in mind. And what is happening when money is printed? Everyone who holds this kind of money is diluted. So this is the whole concept, just to wrap it up uh, very briefly. And what we have seen now is a deflation phase. Um, so the money got more worth relative to the other assets. So the stock prices went down. It was like margin calls, but many aspects came into place for this like spiral into the deflation. Um, and this will continue, I would say. And then at one point, um, and the money is more and more printed, and then we have the opposite effect. We go into a super inflation phase. And then I see that the monetary system we have right now breaks apart. And then I expect them to introduce a central bank digital currency. And this could be a one world currency. And this would be the ultimate dystopy because we don't have um, competition between currencies anymore, not a competition between like fiat currencies anymore. And what we need is what's called a free market of money, uh, which means that money alternatives need to be not suppressed. And we have right now a suppression of gold and Bitcoin because it is taxed. So when you are spending your Bitcoin, you have to always check, oh, how much taxes do I have to pay if you do that? But this is how, you, how it is needed. And this could continue. So they could continue and do a prohibition. And I hope that we have a revolution before that already. And people have to understand how this financial system works so that they step up and that we can change it and that we can switch to a better alternative. Yeah, I, I think it's really important for people to understand that this money is created every day in normal banks. Loaning out money is creating money from banks. And that's, mm. people don't get it. And I, when I first heard it, I was like, this cannot be true. It, it, how does it work? It, this is insane. And yes, it is insane. <laughs> and we, this free market money idea, I... I do agree with it in, in the point that it would be great if we had it, but I don't think it's actually, I don't think it's practical. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think the, the governments or the, the central, the global central bank, if we're going to have something like that, is going to cut back on their measures against different forms of money. So it's say gold and Bitcoin. No, the opposite. They will push for a prohibition. And this is why yeah. the people have to know all that and they have to stand up. So this is what I see. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know if, if we, um, I, I totally agree and people should obviously stand up, but I think it's going to the, the great thing about Bitcoin, for example, is that you don't have to ask these, these guys for permission. You don't have to change their mind. They can tax whatever they want and they can, they can ban it. They can do whatever. That's what Bitcoin has been created for. And that's, that's exactly the the stage, the scenario we are living through right now, that's, that's people, let's say the, the history could have, could not have been any, any better for Bitcoin, right? The, the stage is set, let's say, and I do think it's, it's hopefully going to work out as we've, we've envisioned it and that 
all this all this government printing money all the central bank printing money will end in a new bitcoin standard system what's called and for that we don't have to convince people that we need a free market and stuff we it's going to be created by itself let's say and these all these taxes all these measures against bitcoin won't won't work Do you think the, well, the, the, if, the example with the frog in the water, you know, do you, what stage is that? Like, is the, is the water already boiling or, or, and, and my other question is, should, you know, should, do you think like the system should bleed out by itself, like faster or slower? Because the pain, it's not going to be painless, you know, for most people, there's going to be huge unemployment. It's going to be huge breakdown of economies of, you know, uh, small businesses. Uh, people are going to lose their livelihood, their existence, their jobs. So, It's not going to be painless. The, my question is: I mean, what is the process going to be? Are you know? I mean, uh, what is are there transitional phases in between? Uh, what is what is realistic? Yeah. So I see that more and more people are now questioning the whole system and also questioning the financial system. And if the euro or the U.S. dollar breaks apart, they will question it even more. More and more people will um, right. think of money alternatives, which is Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, I, I do see this prohibition definitely as a, as a, as a threat. So um, if I'm not allowed to like sell my goods in Bitcoin, then cannot be easily be a new monetary system because when I go into jail, because I offer my products in Bitcoin, yeah, and if I have my private key at home and they are searching people, raiding people who have that because they know it from the exchange, they are, you're like, posting on Twitter. So I see it is, uh, it shouldn't be like just taking like that. It's, uh, it's something right. Um, yeah. And so we need really, um, critical mass actually. We need a critical yeah. mass that adopts Bitcoin and would say, no, we don't want the central bank digital currency shit. We want, a um, currency that serves the people and not the elite which is what we have with the fiat system where all the money is transferred to the rich through who can get the money first that is created through that. So this is the Cantillon effect. Do you think the states, uh, the governments would try at least temporarily, like go back somehow, sneak itself back into gold or some kind of, you know, pseudo gold or gold backed currencies before it all, uh, you know, breaks down? What so do you I think heard then? this uh, theory and if they would do it they would again print more you know so mm -hmm. i wouldn't trust them at all that they would mm -hmm. keep that no definitely not so maybe they could do it as a cover story but in fact they're doing something different that's the only thing i would see like personally i can't see us going back to gold um, ever at least not uh, not anytime soon uh, i don't think that the government will will allow such thing to to ever happen Uh, and they have a lot of power and they can use it to, to prevent that uh, as they already did, actually. Guy, uh, did, did you want to say something? I don't think I have um, much to add except it, you know, I think, well, I just think that this system, what we're seeing now is, uh, the the beginnings of um a hyperinflationary dollar how can it not be with just the literally they call they said they have infinite money it, they they said on 60 minutes whatever his name is neil cash Carey, we have infinite amount of money so the more people who realize that money the dollar is infinite and understand that if something has an unlimited supply then how can it hold how can it be valuable and the purchasing power everything i i think this is a longer you know what i don't know i don't think anyone can know because we i think we as you know people have a bias and we we try to perceive the future based on the past and i don't think the past can really show us what can happen here because All, they might they might just rot themselves, print themselves to death, and then somehow Bitcoin just becomes globally, I don't know, the, 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 the money because it's just gotten so out of hand and it becomes like a political nation state kind of game where 
they need something that's not controlled by one party, right? But maybe that's wishful thinking and maybe this will continue for another decade. Uh, who knows? But gold is definitely not the answer because anyone who uses gold and then sees Bitcoin, Bitcoin is better than gold in every single right. way. Yeah, because it's all, that all the man cannot... monetary properties, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it. okay, you can't hold it in your hand, you know, big deal. That's I can't hold thing. the information, yeah. I, right? Like, exactly. <laughs> um, so the more people who use gold, like, again, I see that as bullish for Bitcoin, but as far as how and when, who knows? I mean, ugh. Personally, I'm of the opinion. Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, sir. Um, okay, so I don't think we're going for hyperinflation, to be honest, because even though they're printing a lot of money, there is uh, a strong deflationary uh, pressure from from the market because right now loans are being wiped out uh, because businesses are failing uh, because of the shutdowns and everything. Loans are being wiped out, and loans are basically money. <laughs> these days uh, through fractional reserve banking uh, so as people default on their loans the money uh, supply contracts um, which basically means that they are just countering the um, sorry that they're just countering the deflation uh, maybe even exceeding it maybe not I'm, I'm not sure I can you can tell that um, but I don't think we will see hyper uh, hyperinflation uh, per se uh, also, people. Yeah, maybe maybe I use that now? maybe I use that term wrong. Um, sorry, you. I, I agree with you. I agree with you completely. We are going to see a, a um, loss of purchasing power, mm -hmm. like never before. Yeah. And that's gonna. I don't know wh how long that would mm -hmm. take, but th in the last decade since two thousand and eight, you know, I, I live in America, and the loss of purchasing power, with what they've done. I think it's like four trillion dollars, something like that, between in the last twelve years, and we've done that in like what two days, six trillion, ten trillion, I think, right? Last week. I mean, it's um, and it takes time. Obviously, it takes time for that to trickle down, right? To get to get into to mess up the purchasing power, but the purchasing power is just going to be horrific. I heard uh, um, just uh, recently a panel discussion with Marty Bent. I don't know if it was with Corey Clipson, you know, and. Um, who was like Connor Brown and a couple of other people. Um, and Marty Bent, I don't know who, where he got this information. I think he talked to other experts or, or people who, who really know what's going on. And he said approximately minimum of 45 to 50 trillion US dollars would have to be printed to just hold together the economical system. That's just a minimum. So now regarding hype inflation, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as they start, it, it's already programmed. It's already, as soon as they start with UBI, universal basic income, like helicopter money, you know, or, or mm -hmm. just putting, you know, like this, oh, you know, uh, uh, like whatever thousand, twelve hundred dollars is mean, it's, this is ludicrous while all other corp corporations are like being bailed out. And now they're starting to buy corporate bonds. I mean, it's never been done before, right, in history. So anyway, so once they start with UBI, I think then we're going to see hyperinflation. You don't think so? Yeah, I think I think this is like with UBI that might be the case. Um, but again, I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you it also, yeah, it depends on where the money gets uh, into, uh, in, in which part of the economy. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, you can tell uh, for sure. Yeah, this is exactly what you have to differentiate where the money goes to. So one, it could go to speculation and investment. And we have an incredible increase of asset prices in the last year. So I would already call this kind of a hyperinflation. So where, where do you set the boundary? But it's like really extreme, right. you know, and not the production increase, but it's just speculation. It's just because there was so much money pumped into the system. So first we have it for speculation purposes. Then we have it for investment and making new businesses. And then we have it for consumption. So maybe to like lay this out. Yeah, yeah I would also I would... agree with keep it simple that it's really difficult to predict the time frame, And I don't think people appreciate how difficult it is. So if you make predictions, it always sounds reasonable. Let's say your, your time frame or your explanations for any any prediction any future event but it's really it's really 
good guesswork, I would say, and we don't really know what is what is going to happen. And no one could have predicted what's going on right now because it's really insane. And I wanted to add something. Also, the the Bitcoin and gold, let's say, comparison, which keep it simple, also uh, mentioned is really going to the advantages of Bitcoin, which is the digital nature. You don't have something physical to hold in your hand, but that's the advantage. That's the advantage if they come to your house and want your Bitcoin, then it's really difficult to find it. And mm -hmm. you can have it, actually you can have your private key in your, in your head, in your mind, if you remember it. So it's really this, this trying to get rid of Bitcoin holders is really difficult compared to gold, which is one of the most important things people don't realize. And that's how gold, how the gold standard ended. And that's hopefully the, the, one of the big advantages that Bitcoin has, which hopefully makes it succeed. Well, eventually you could also hide your Bitcoin, at, uh, your gold at home. So, yeah. yeah, but it's way more difficult. I mean, for large sums, it's almost impossible and you cannot cross yeah, the borders with it. And it's really, you know, not the great as a, the comparison or let's say the, the, uh, the, who has the advantage and this is not even a debate it's really bitcoin is insanely better for all these borderless and all yeah, these things yeah, that yeah. your asset cannot be seen by the government and it's really but, hopefully uh hopefully an advantage that will play out in the long run yeah one thing so when i'm on a festival i mostly or often don't have any internet connection so i couldn't use bitcoin and here I do think that for such use cases, we could use gold or silver. But you know, these are very small use cases, but I definitely consider it as possible. And maybe the elderly would prefer that they have some physical things in their hand. And I think it's totally fine. You know, we should have a free market of money and everyone can decide what they want and what they trade their goods and services for. Yeah, I'm, that's I, I, obviously true, but it's not, a, I don't think it's a valid point saying that gold is in any way going to be money again or that there's a good argument that it's going to be money and i don't think trying to let's say if, if someone hears that they might think there is a there's a debate going on which is better and there is but there, there, there is a there's no valid points on the gold side there actually isn't and this well, i just made a point what do you think about that no the the internet thing is also not valid because it actually works without internet so with radio waves yeah i saw that. yeah you can do it you can do whatever you like if you can transmit some amount of data you, you can do it so it's really there are, there might be some scenarios where you, you cannot transact data and that's really bad but there you probably have some more more you have some problems that are way worse than trying to send money well, yeah actually on this uh, festival i couldn't also phone or anything everything was like locked down and <laughs> so you can you still give someone an open dime with bitcoin on it and they can verify it and stuff so it's really you can there's it's not really in great great uh, great to be on the side of gold in this argumentation for global money there's really i don't see any <clears throat> can great I, arguments can i ask you guys a question um i think you know an argument can be made for both sides but every single time an individual has to take possession. So I've experienced this. I've bought gold, I've bought silver. And then what do I have to do? I have to verify it. Mm -hmm. What I is a huge yeah. pain in the ass? I have yeah. to spend. Mm -hmm. I have to first, I have to research. Then I have to find equipment. Then I have to take the bars or the coins or whatever. Coins are a pain in the ass because they're not thick enough so that you need more sensitive equipment. So it is such a pain in the ass because Every single bar coin I have to verify. Now, if you take someone and you say, okay, you take, take these physical metals, you buy them from somewhere. It's, it's definitely not private um, unless you buy from an individual. You have to verify it, huge pain in the ass. Every single piece you have to verify just, and then, and then you have to hold it. It is so expensive mentally, physically, uh, monetarily just to acquire and to hold that stuff. And then you give someone Bitcoin, you explain to them just very rudimentally, look, look how easy this is to verify, to hold, to send. So I think if, if 
you force people because most people have never even had to hold a physical, you know, gold or silver. They've, they've, they've only dealt with fiat money globally, right? There are very few people that even understand the, the costs associated with physical metals. So I think that makes the point for Bitcoin. Of course, you can argue uh, for physical metals as well. It's just, it's just hard for me, my perspective, to wrap my head around how that has any value. Um, and I could make, you know, I could talk about all the different points, right? But just that, just the, the assaying, the headache is massive compared to Bitcoin. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, this validation and storage problem, which I talked about in my essay, and which I think is the biggest difference to gold, is the, the reason gold became so centralized because it's such a pain in the ass to do it individually. And it, you, it's not really practical to validate everything individually and to store it. That's where large storage units, banks, large validation facilities come in. And that's where the government goes easily to seize all the gold, basically, or all the precious metals, most of it in the circulation. So that's really the, 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 the centralization because of those, those problems is really the big advantage of Bitcoin. So maybe what I want to lay out with this is that we need um, to change. We, we don't want this fiat system because it's not good for the people and we want an alternative system and this is Bitcoin. And, but we want the people to be free. So if some people want to use gold, they should be free to do so. And for some people, they would maybe prefer it for whatever reason. So for us, um, we prefer Bitcoin or uh, maybe for my festival, I prefer gold or whatever. And I think everyone should be free to do what they want. Yeah, of course, we, sure. we all agree on the libertarian Thanks. point that <laughs> no, no one wants to ban gold or tell someone else how to, do, how to yeah. accept payments. I'm fully, fully agreeing on that. And I don't, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to get people to understand why, why Bitcoin is way more valuable than gold and why they should. Mm -hmm. Hold but it's still, and, but it's still uh, important, I think, to remind the people of the fundamental monetary property and, and the unique, unique property of Bitcoin, and that is the absolute scarcity. And I always say, you know, I mean, I, I still, I mean, can we validate like how much, because, you know, these are the official numbers. They say there's approximately 200,000 tons on stock, like existing gold, like, uh, you know, we already have and mined. And each year, I don't know, what is it, like 3,000, 3,500 tons per year additionally. So that's the flow. Um, so, but it's still, it's, it ha gold has a relative scarcity compared to the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. So it's mm -hmm. all about a question of resources, energy work, and especially technological innovation. Once you have the technological innovation, I mean, who knows how much gold there is additionally on the surface and underneath, you know, uh, uh, on the, what do you call it? Oceans, uh, ground and, and let alone, you know, asteroids and just leave it, leave that aside. But don't you think that that is like this? I mean, how do you how do you validate? I mean, with Bitcoin, with every second, I can just show you, you know, right now on the on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? How much, uh, like uh, every ten plus ten plus minus every ten minutes, there's a block, right? So this is like the hundred percent, like what you just said previously. Uh, don't trust verify, and this is what's possible with with Bitcoin as a settle, first of all, a settlement layer, global settlement layer, store of value, meet of exchange, unit account. What else do we need is the question. So I was just uh, reading a number on Twitter. Uh, Mark Steiner posted it that uh, Markus Kral wrote in his book that uh, uh, Buch, Buch gold market, which is like the book to gold market, is actually 84 times higher than the physical gold market. Mm -hmm. So they're like saying there would be much more than there is. And uh, yeah, that's a great problem. But there's also one thing I would like to point out. This is the problem with custody providers in general. So if you have a custody provider that you don't trust and um, he just accumulates Bitcoin and then he says he has more Bitcoin than he really has. So we have this problem with 
central authorities that are not trustworthy. But yeah, with Bitcoin, you can say, okay, everyone has their own address and they can check it up. So there's also, uh, and this they can verify on the Bitcoin blockchain. So there is again uh, the other term, but yeah, I, I just want to lay out, you have to be careful with this whole thing of custody providers and that they have to be like trustworthy and you have to really take care how they do that and that you can preferably check your own address that the Bitcoin are really lying there that you put in. Yeah, I, I I agree, and I would say that there is some problems with Bitcoin and exchanges and uh, exchange exchanges saying how much Bitcoin they have, and they probably also don't have as much as they claim to have. And there there have been some some conversation about it. But the most important point is that if you have your own keys with your own Bitcoin validated by your own node, there's nothing they can do. They they can have the 0% fractional reserve and the 0.001% Bitcoin uh, from what they're claiming to have. And it's really bad for those people who have Bitcoin on the exchange or in the custody service. But for you holding your own keys, validating everything by yourself, it doesn't matter at all. You can, you, you don't, you don't care. And that's the really the great yeah. difference. I agree. Totally. <laughs> So Stephanie, you 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 you, you mentioned the, um, this, this is one of the main topics with the critical ma adoption or mass adoption, whatever you call it. Like, unfortunately, people need need to experience the necessity. So out of necessity, you know, you get creativity, you you get the human action, as we call it in Austrian economics. So what Mises, you know, is, was preaching like mo what hundred years ago. So what what is necessary? You think to go into human action? Like, like, how yeah. do we reach that critical adoption? It it needs it needs uh you know a pain, a suffering, or an understanding. Like, okay, this is I have no other choice. I guess once people have no other choice, they will go into Bitcoin because they see their purchasing power is being uh, exponentially reduced. Then you know once we go into this phase of whatever uh, super uh, you know. Uh, trillions and quadrillions of printing and then UBI, universal basic income, helicopter money, um, uh, bailing out, you know, all these corporations and, 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 and then you have also in high unemployment and, uh, you know, every other, you know, side effect you get out of this. I think this is, this is where we get into critical adoption. So are we ready? I mean, is my question to you, are we ready uh, once millions and then billions of people want to go into Bitcoin? Are we ready yet? So maybe to the pain and suffering, um, I think this is exactly what is transpiring right now because they're printing more and more, right? So I see a deflationary phase first and then we will have this inflationary phase. And then they will come with a central bank digital currency and then everyone needs to know how a wallet works. And if they know that, that then they can also use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So we have really some good things on our side. And yeah. Uh, yeah, there was something circulating. Caitlin Long was uh, posting it. It was, uh, I think, it was was it from Mises or Hayek that it can like go really quickly, just in a few weeks. Oh. Yeah, and I do think it's it's really people in Bitcoin or Bitcoiners sometimes underestimate how how new everything is, meaning how new the infrastructure is. So if we had now billions of people coming in and whatever amount of uh, dollars, let's say, coming in, it would, I don't know if it, I don't know if everything works out as, as we hope to. I, I hope it's going to be slow or slower than, let's say, everything is crumbling in the next two weeks and we, we have everyone coming into Bitcoin. So I hope it's going to be, mm -hmm. we're going to be, have some, some more time to prepare all this infrastructure and the system to adopt and so people can can come in and hopefully some some of those things we have talked about like having your own private key or running your own node and all of those things that are important get really easy with time and if we if we have some more time to make technical innovations and to educate people like keep it simple is doing then we might might I'd have a better shot in the long term than we have with everyone coming in right now, let's say. 
Yeah, this is also why I, I really love the technology. I mean, the the platforms. The even Breeze had just come out with a new, uh, you know, platform or, or, or let's just call it technology or, or uh, you know, Jack Mahler Strike. You know, where people don't even think while paying. You know, they they just pay in fiat, and eventually they would. Or as you said, Stephanie, you know, once you know, even if it's uh, even if they come out with a central bank digital currency and their you know centralized wallets, eventually people are going to see. Why, you know, why hold on to a, you know, centralized fiat uh, uh, digital currency um, where, you know, the purchasing power is being reduced and reduced while I can, you know, store my value into Bitcoin. I think this is going to be a huge uh, driver. Yeah. The critical adoption. Sorry. Uh, did you want to say something, uh, Ben? Okay. Um, nothing. Not much on the, like, I don't think Bitcoin is ready for a billion users right now. I really don't think we can handle such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's that's gonna happen. Uh, like anytime soon, I don't think a billion users will just come in a few weeks or something like that. Um, I think there's, uh, it, it will be a long process. Uh, it might be like very gradual and then like a real break. But if it is, then it's we're still far from it. Um, but for now, yeah, I think there is like right now there's a lot of progress, uh, a lot of projects are coming out, um, a lot of infrastructure is being built. I think we're in a good direction so far. Okay, uh, I want to ask you something. I mean, you do all these tutorials. What's, what's your feedback like from people who just got into Bitcoin, they're really average person, Joe, uh, you know, on the street? What's the feedback you, you're receiving, like with with the tutorials you're making? Are you know, people, yeah, people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I um look. My intention with doing it is that I want to create something where people can follow along, because maybe they don't understand everything yet, and just being able to follow along and do it will pique some kind of interest, right? My all my guides are very much focused on look this is a private way, this is a non-private way, like become aware of privacy, become aware, you know, which, which I think a lot of people don't uh, consider, maybe they don't understand, maybe they don't care about, but I'm always, that's my, you know, that's what I like, that's what I want. So it's gonna be in there. Um, I, I started making videos because I didn't see anybody doing what I thought needed to be out there except uh, for 402, um, 402 payments, uh, 402 payment, payment required, was doing videos, tutorial videos, and that's kind of what inspired me. For, 402 payment rec on uh, Twitter. But uh, they stopped making videos. So all my videos are made not for really even people now, it's made for the next influx, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff will be dated, but maybe, it'll be helpful and you know i keep making videos but the videos are not for people on bitcoin twitter who are talking shit and who understand all the different facets the videos are for my my you know 70 year old mom you know who may you know well, that's not a good example but <laughs> someone older um who needs to just kind of be handheld through it because they're son or their nephews like do this just put a little money because the dollar is being devalued or whatever right like that hardcore bitcoiner as an e so it's like an easy resource and then maybe it helps some other people to nuances right like oh well if you if you connect to a public electrum server then all your xpubs are, are being leaked like your privacy things like that um but i'm kind of making it for the future really i'm not making it for now because i don't i don't think we are having a large influx of new users. I think it's just kind of been churned since 2018. Definitely some, uh, but um, yeah, I don't think it's like, it's not like 2017 where people are just rushing in, shit coins are everywhere, you know what I mean? People are uh, learning the hard way, it's, it's way different. And um, hopefully there'll be another wave in and unfortunately there'll probably be more shit coins. But um, I hope it helps, you know, I just, I do it, I do it for the future. I do it 
to help even even one person. And I've had some people reach out to me and you know thank me and like oh this helped me or I was able to do this and you know that's it that's that's all that matters. If I help one person, that's good enough. You know. Right. Do you think we can make it easier? I mean, for people, because I mean, I talk to a lot of people. I help them, you know, with setting up the Harvey wallet. I mean, I just, you know, I just help friends or it's, I mean, the feedback I get is, is, is the information is out there. Is like, even, you know, setting up a full node is, 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 do you think we could make it easier? Like uh, a little bit more intuitive? I know I'm, sometimes I repeat myself it's, with this problem, but. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think it's like, it's like learning a new language, you know? Mm. How easy can you make that for someone? Mm. You can give them the tools, they have to walk through it and learn. And however they learn, you know, maybe they get, uh, they learn via audio, maybe they learn via video, maybe they learn via a book. Everybody has a different um, way that they like to learn. And it's the same thing with Bitcoin, because I think it's like learning a language. I mean, this is like a, a new language it's a whole new paradigm and there are concepts that don't exist anywhere else. So of course it's going to be challenging and you know, I make videos. So my thing is visual. Some people write articles, some people um, podcast and it's like the combination and the synthesis of all of it creates a, you know, a way for people to kind of pick and choose and learn the best way they can. But it's, I don't, it's going to be a while before it's like, before it's just like using, you know, some like Venmo, right. Or some kind of app. It's going to be a while. It's because uh, there's so much, there's just so much to do. There's so much going on behind the scenes that needs to be, you know, uh, planned and designed in a good kind of UI. Um, it's tough. I think the toughest aspect is actually, actually this paradigm shift. The people have to become self-sovereign. There's nobody who can like save your private key. You have it on your own. Right. And I think there's a lot of fear. Oh, I cannot go to my bank. You then like um, gives me my, my pin number again, or I go to my uh, custody account. I think uh, this is actually the greatest change that they have to do and to really become convenient with being self-sovereign. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I think, you know, if, if you tell someone they're in a cage and you open the door of the cage, if they are not willing to acknowledge they are in a cage, they will not walk out. You cannot help anybody. Mm -hmm. All you can do is provide them the tools to help themselves. So it's, again, fundamentally, this is about self-sovereignty. This is about personal responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. Bitcoin is Bitcoin is just like the the trigger for that, right? Like it's it's like, hey, this thing exists. Are you going to step forward? Like, meet me halfway. Bitcoin will do fifty percent of the work. You as the individual need to do fifty percent of the work. Meet in the middle. If you're not willing to do fifty percent of the work, it like it doesn't matter how amazing Bitcoin is or how easy it is. None of that matters. Yeah, you yeah. made it. That's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a totally different mindset. I mean, people taking responsibility, regaining, as you said, self sovereignty. It's you know, this is totally, totally something really like evolutionary. Like, like people need to, you know, take take responsibility for their own lives and 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 and. And understand, you know, what is possible with Bitcoin. I think this is my main concern that people just don't understand what is possible. You know, what are the potential realities that we can create on on this fundamental, you know, layer or, or soil of Bitcoin? So, where do you see all this going? I mean, guys, I mean, do you think it's all? I mean, do you think we're already like on the precipice? Like, either we're going totally, you know, either you know, also talking about in the beginning about civil liberties, freedom. Is it once once this thing you know um, um, increases in speed? Do you think it it uh, can it be reversed, or are we on this you know precipice where people now have to make a decision now? You know, not in ten years, but really now or pretty soon. You know, like 
Yeah. So I was reading online that some people said it would be too late, but no, I definitely don't agree with that. We have this agenda, which is going to reducing the liberties and going to a totalitarian worldwide state with central bank digital currency as one piler, one pile, um, pillar. <laughs> And um, then we have the people that want to have their freedom and more and more people are waking up to this. And I think the uh, percentage of people who want to be free is growing and the more pain we have, the more it is growing. So I do see that we have a revolution and the earlier it is, the less damage we will have. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that's, that's, some, that's a scenario people have laid out, which is not the fast hyper Bitcoinization scenario, but basically where we have a parallel economic system, which is yeah. driving under Bitcoin. And then when things are going to get really bad with the normal system, which at this rate is going to happen in the next couple of years, and um, we, will, we will have this alternative system already let's say kind of running and people can switch over without too much loss. There's going to be a lot of pain, obviously, but there's, we will try to mitigate that. And that's, that's where all this, all this infrastructure work is coming in. And that's where people need to realize if we talk now about this and make our, try to try to explain what is going on, try to make arguments for, you should look into this Bitcoin thing it's it's for the people that that are not into it right now so you will have a better future you don't have to go through this pain of losing all your money or losing all the purchasing power of your money to realize how important it is if you understand it now but if you don't you will learn the hard way as people have also learned the hard way in icos and shit coins and all of this kind of stuff so that's basic that's that's the hopeful scenario where, where we have this alternative system already set up and ready for all all the people are coming in by uh, parallel system you also i mean uh, so i know what you mean like like uh, is that what what i sometimes i think call circle economies or other people call circle economies like you have like clusters you know of uh, self feeding you know economies of scale or you know mini scale where people are just you know not only you know putting it as a store of value, but really exchanging, tr trading, transacting with one another, like amongst each other. Yeah, I'm, yeah, that's that's basically mm -hmm. what I mean. So okay. spending is obviously not, you, you don't spend your Bitcoin, but it should be it should be noted that this infrastructure needs to be there. So it needs to be easy to accept it and to spend it as well. Even if you shouldn't do it now, you need to, if the whole economy is going to run on Bitcoin, you need to be able to do it. So this, this, this alternative system needs to be created now where people can easily spend it, merchant can easily accept it. Mm -hmm. And so that we don't have these, these developments happening when everyone is coming in because that's going to be way too late. And then the system might not be ready for everyone coming in. Ben, Kai, do you want to add anything? I want to uh, uh, know your perspective, like where do you see yeah, this going? Sure. Yeah, I, I I certainly don't think it's too late. I think Bitcoin is certainly on time here. Um, I think we, we still have a long way to go before things really start to change. Uh, but again, yeah, I might be wrong and everything will, you know, I think it collapse at any moment right now, I guess. Um, but I do think that we still have more time to, to prepare for that. I still think Bitcoin has a long way to go um, for that. Um, not sure besides that. I still think like the, the important thing for people right now, uh, I don't think most people will understand the fundamentals of, uh, of freedom, uh, the fundamentals of, of Bitcoin. Um, and everything that free market, what free market is, I, I don't think we can rely on, on people to understand that. But what we can rely on people to understand is that the number go up. Uh, I think the pricing system is, of course, a, a great information tool. Um, and Bitcoin 
and, and I think the, the value of Bitcoin will be reflected for its price. I think people will become aware of the importance of Bitcoin just because they will, uh, and they will see its price rise. Uh, they will start asking themselves why, uh, why it's rising, uh, what is Bitcoin? But I don't think that they will uh, come from fundamentals or uh, from principles. I think they will come from, you know, from the pricing uh, signals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Very fascinating. Kai, what's your take? What's your perspective? You know, what's the saying? Change happens slowly, gradually, and then all at once. Uh, <laughs> if you had asked, if you know, two months ago, three months ago, if you had told anybody in the States that you're going to be locked down, you're not, the economy is going to get shut down um, because of this virus, they would have looked at you. You know, in fact, I was talking to people about that um, and they look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> so again, you know, if, if you're going to, um, if you're going to extrapolate future based on past, you will always be unprepared because you have no idea what could happen. I mean, anything that you can imagine could happen. Aliens could invade next week. It could happen. Is it likely? Nobody, we don't know. Maybe well, I don't think are aliens are hostile, to be honest with you. I don't think, well, I think, I think human beings are more hostile than or aliens. But <laughs> Regardless, who knows, right? Like, right. Uh, so look, I'm very passionate about bitcoin right. um i think it's the most important thing right now on the planet because it's it's a way to take back your sovereignty and liberty and the money's messed up and all those things um do i think numbers going to go up long term yes short term maybe maybe not uh it doesn't matter for me because as long as it doesn't get inflated away that's good enough for me right like if the price of bitcoin rises only as a result of the us dollar losing purchasing power mm -hmm. that's enough right. which is probably you know one of the ways it's going to go up right so a hundred thousand dollar bitcoin in 10 years may not be any different purchasing power wise than ten thousand dollar bitcoin is now exactly you know yes. that yes. would be terrible yeah but <laughs> This is okay. what people understand, by the way. Yeah, the purchasing power. It's the purchasing power. Like one single That's Satoshi right now in 10 years could be, you know, could buy you whatever, you know, like a huge pack of, of ice cream. It doesn't matter, you know, but, but it's a purchasing power that people are going to uh, feel, you know. So, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. I prepare, I, I hope for the best and I prepare for the worst. Always. So what are you going to do? You just do the best that you can. Um, <laughs> You know, and just remember that fear is the greatest enemy. When you live in fear, you can be manipulated. You make decisions that are against your best interest. You make those. Nobody makes them for you. You make bad decisions that, that compromise you because you're doing them out of fear. So, um, yeah, I just, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, and educate yourself. There's nothing else that we can do. Right. Mm -hmm. Balance. I love your balanced view. Yeah. So, guys, I want to wrap this up. Um, do you guys have any closing remarks or sources? Uh, I know Sven has a, has a website. It's called uh, limitlesscuriosity.com. What about you, Stephanie? Do you, uh, do you have any closing remarks, final thoughts? Um, well, <laughs> I just mm -hmm. have my Twitter account now, but I aim to create educational content on how the financial system um, is actually working. And yeah, I will publish this through many channels. So if you follow me on Twitter, you will find this out as well. Great. Yeah, so you can look me up on, on my website, as you've said limitless curiosity or also on twitter obviously mm -hmm. and i wanted to oh yeah big shout out to 6102 bitcoin mm -hmm. he's he's great so if people want to learn about it learn about bitcoin you should check him out on twitter and check his website out bitcoinintro.com 
Yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah, there's so many resources. Sorry, it's just so many uh, uh, shout outs we could do right now. We have Gigi and who else? I don't know. There's so many authors and podcasters, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, for me, Twitter also. I also post everything on Twitter as well, uh, mostly on Medium uh, when I publish articles. Great, Ben. Yeah, I, um, you know, I have my YouTube channel. Um, I'm looking at other ways to, to post videos because uh, I don't want everything to be dependent on YouTube. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Kiss Bitcoin, K-I-S Bitcoin. And I am also um, tonight going to uh, record a Zoom. It's not going to be live, but uh, I don't know if you guys have seen on Twitter. I'm um, betting American HODL on Twitter. <laughs> um, and Matt O'Dell is going to be the uh, third key holder. So we're doing a multi-sig bet and we're going to make a video. I'm going to make a video of how to use Caravan, which is a stateless um, multi-sig wallet creator. It's pretty cool, actually, really easy to use. And uh, I'll probably release that in the next couple of days. I'll get that out quick. Um, but um, everything is going to be transparent and we're betting, you know, on the Bitcoin price because I'm a long-term bull. I really, you know, I believe in this, but short-term, I think, the price is going to take a, a big hit, which, you know, I don't think is a bad thing um, because I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, sh when I say shit coinery, I, I mean perspective, right? Uh, kind of conspicuous consumption, greedy type of uh, mentality that I think still needs to be um, bled out. So I think that should provide some entertainment for people. Uh, and um, yeah, that's all I got going on. Thank you. Excellent. So guys, we should repeat this as, as often as possible on a regular basis, maybe in the future. Uh, really learned so much from you and it was really inspirational. And yeah, let's hope for the best. Stay healthy. Thanks. Thank Great, you. thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Really fascinating multi-spectrum conversation with, with uh, awesome Bitcoiners and friends of mine. And I uh, hope we can repeat this in the future on a regular basis. Let me know what you think. Uh, follow all of us. Follow me on Twitter. Um, really would support, uh, would really appreciate your support. Your um, Thank you to all my listeners, followers, and subscribers. And if you are... Um, if you're a Bitcoin sponsor, get in touch with me, hello at the totalconnector.com is my email address. And yeah, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of yourself. And hope to repeat this as often as possible. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.